I feel like perhaps we've addressed this before. I think we have, but I'm going to riff on it again. We, I have no intention of doing any quote unquote Christian movies because mm. the ones I've seen are mostly garbage. <laughs> In fact, I remember one specific night where we had some friends who were like, hey, let's watch a movie at the news center. What's this on the DVD shelf? Courageous. Oh, man, I had a field day with that movie. There were just so many things. They're, they're so tropey. I couldn't stop myself from ripping it apart. Just They're also jerk. just not well-made films. No. I think You're, it just from a technical perspective. The focus yeah. goes too hard on writing a christian movie that they forget to write a good movie well like what was that movie about there was like three different things going on independent of each other and you weren't really sure what supposed to be vaguely inspiring yeah something about god the movie was shot or it was edited like a trailer for the movie so you probably got more out of the trailer for the movie than you did out of the actual movie yeah there's just a world of stuff wrong with that I think it's like, oh, come on, I like it. It's like, yeah, you were vaguely inspired. That's why you liked it. It it hit your emotional buttons. Which is about all it did. It had nothing of substance to offer. And and if you sit down to watch a movie to get emotionally buttons pushed, then that's (laughs) exactly the kind of movie you want to go watch. You're slightly less worse off than if you watched like a rom-com or something. Um, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh there's just a lot of stereotypes in there too that I was just like, are they seriously like okay. All right. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh it's a it's a good thing our friends were of good humor at us completely <laughs> eviscerating it and didn't get mad because I was uh Yeah I was um <laughs> You were you were popping off on it. Oh, I don't yeah. think I was there for that, but I have heard plenty about it in the intervening mm-hmm. time. I remember <laughs> being in the room while you tore apart part a movie. Was that courageous? That was courageous. I yeah. remember seeing a line that is that was so uh, tropey, so yeah. you know, cut and paste that I just. Knew it was coming, and I said it exactly at the same yeah. time. It was like <laughs> you know, it's a good movie when you can predict the lines without ever having seen. You can predict the tropey lines. He's like, oh. they're, they're like a poor family, and he's like, I wish I was a rich man. And his wife goes up to him and says, "You are a rich man." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I saw that coming a mile away. It's like, yeah, you mean emotionally rich, but that doesn't solve your financial problems no. that you are actually having. <laughs> nah. Uh, and plus, like, the whole deal with, like, his daughter dying or something is just so out of left field and has virtually no impact on the rest of the movie. It's like, what is even going on here? Anyway, this isn't – we're not talking about this anymore. No. I've had, that is enough. Oh, wait. What, uh, other films I don't really want to give a chance are the God's Not Dead movies. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, – What's a Christian way of, or a, a charitable way of saying this? Um, it's a fever dream for argumentative types among, or fundamentalists, I will say, is my impression of it. Imagine the worst atheist possible is going after this innocent Christian kid at school. Mm. But, yeah. It's not a terrible movie. It's not a great movie either. Yeah, there's probably far worse. There's also far there's better. There's also courageous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and basically anything made by what are those guys? What's that? Look at the um. Uh, these guys. What was the guy who directed that? I don't know. I think it was. They, they it just, wasn't uh, the Coen Snyder. Brothers. That's Fargo. <laughs> they just feel like Hallmark movies, but they mentioned God a couple more times. Yeah, like, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, let's see. Low budget, 
mediocrely directed and acted. And the Kendricks, edited. the Kendrick brothers. Yeah, those they're awful. Anyway, they're probably nice enough people with good intentions, but the road to cinematograph- uh, cinematographic hell <laughs> is paved with good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's I mean, see. There are some like solid Christian films. Uh, you yeah, got, you got uh, Mel Gibson's The Passion. Right. The Passion just, of the Christ is the just Passion a phenomenal film. Yes, it's a phenomenal film that really sells the emotional and psychological weight of what Jesus goes through during the Passion yeah. and stuff. So it's like, and it's just it's well acted. Jim Caviezel mm-hmm. well, is a really Jim good Jim Caviezel. Actor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there's exceptions to the the rule that most Christian movies yeah. aren't that great. Uh, Apparently, the Chosen is also extremely good, well put together. Hmm. It's a a new TV series, I think. Okay. What's the platform it's on? Is I it like? I think it's on Netflix. That's what I've heard. Is it? Then. Oh, yeah. interesting. I'd be willing to give it a chance. Well, I've heard from a lot of people who I know care about having well put together media that it's really good. So Okay. And Netflix plus like the guy who plays Jesus is actually like Roman Catholic. I think he converted from Orthodox or, or something like or he was like raised Orthodox or something. I forget what the story was, but he's Roman Catholic himself, so that's kind of interesting. But, uh, yeah, I'm intrigued. How, how, how is... Netflix is, ha, offers quite the spectrum of moral uh, things. Yes. <laughs> One might say. Of, of morality. It's like, how do they green light those two things? Oh, wait, they green light everything. Never mind. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Welcome it, to Netflix. You're green lit. Money. How can we help you? <laughs> Um, if we think you're gonna make any money whatsoever, mm-hmm. if you can make a slight profit, but then we'll take you. Then if you you do make a profit, you're greenlit for season two as long as you randomly insert a gay character. Mm-hmm. More or less. Um, let's see, What's something non ranty to talk about. Something non ranty. Well. Uh, how has your week been at the seminary? My week at the seminary has been largely the same as most weeks at the seminary. Okay. I was going to say, like, are we sure this is something non-rancy to talk about? No. <laughs> it sounds no, like no, not, no. This week. No. not this week. Not this week. I'm sure okay. in, like, three or four weeks I'll probably be getting to that point as <sighs> final papers start uh-huh. being a thing. Hmm. But presently we're just chugging along. Um, most people have stuff to do on Wednesdays because it's sort of like the, the pastoral ministry day mm. sure. where no one has classes. Everyone just goes and does their ministry assignments. But since we're all locked in here this year, everyone gets to do them virtually. Nice. Mm. How does that work? You do th- the same thing you would, except you do it on Zoom. Uh-huh. Interesting. So, like, different years have different themes to their ministry. So, like, first theology is more centered on university ministry. Second theology mm. is on, like, hospital ministry. So, like, one of my other, the other guys from my diocese is doing, like, he's calling some homebound people from his, one of the parishes in our diocese. Uh, okay. Okay. Because that's sort of what he would be doing in person here if he had he were able to. So, mm-hmm. sure. The the brand new first philosophy guys, such as myself, we don't have we have our work cut out for us. We don't yeah. have to go and figure out what our assignment is. They kind of have a more structured program. So sure. Good we way don't to get ease to do any it. real ministry yet. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty of that, though, I when am, the time I'm comes. Sure. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Playing with gadgets is fun. I got to do a lot of that this week. I am getting to. Um, <clears throat> doing. Uh, I thought 360 cameras were kind of gimmicky, 
but then I rented one for work and I'm kind of addicted now. It's really fun to mess around with, um, doing virtual tours for the school's system. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, a little bit irritating because apparently the app to control the camera doesn't go on most Android phones. So I have to drag my work, la- uh, my work iPad with me everywhere. Hmm. which is a little cumbersome at times, but I've managed to make it work. The thing that's kind of fun about the 360 camera is that it's a modular camera about the size of a GoPro when it's put together. So it's just kind of fun to like put together and mess with and stuff. It's like, oh yeah, this scratches that oh, itch yeah. for me. It's all coming together. <laughs> it's all coming together. <laughs> 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 yep. <laughs> so that's fun. I, I've enjoyed that. And then... uh homecoming festivities have been a little hectic and interesting i might be taking pictures at a football game this friday we'll see they're having high school football yep middle school football or whatever school high school yeah okay yeah they have like junior varsity but that's like junior high sure so i don't think the middle school has junior varsity is definitely not junior high oh it's not no is that middle school no Middle school's middle school. Math oh. is math. <laughs> <laughs> Junior varsity is like 11th graders. Mm. 11th grade. The 11th graders who aren't good enough to be on varsity, like me. Gotcha. Nice. I was mm. an 11th grader. But then you got to shove around all the other JV yeah. guys. I weighed 60 more pounds than everyone else on the field, so I flattened everyone. <laughs> there was one play that I I pushed one guy from the right hash to the left side line in one play. <laughs> it's like oh, you're moving, bud. Just, we we scored a touchdown on the run, so the guy ran for our running back ran for eighty yards. So I just kept pushing until the whistle blew. Because <laughs> that's what you do. It's like I'm not stopping until the whistle blows, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The uh, fall weather has been rather spectacular. Like it's been upper, like mid upper sixties, lower seventies, and just sunny and beautiful, and the trees are all colorful. And it's just like, man, I wish I didn't work in an office with no windows. But if I did, I might get, not get as much work done. So there's that. Yeah, it's a little cold first thing in the morning when I'm out there on the airstrip with UPS, but. Mm-hmm. Um, on my walks to to class and back, it's really, really just pleasant. A lot less rainy than last year because there were multiple times last year I was walking to class in the fall and just got soaked either going or coming from class. So, yeah. I'm told can't... it gets rainy here as opposed to snowy in the winter. I believe it. And it's just overcast all the time, so I'm not really looking forward to that. Sounds like what Southern people call winter. Yes. Well, you, you don't have to shovel rain. <laughs> That's if you true. Do, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. If you're shoveling rain, if it's chocolate rain, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Speaking of chocolate rain. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of. <laughs> Something that's even older than that is what we're talking about today. That came out in 2009, but we, the Palladium Papists, I'm James. I'm Nathan. And I'm Bradley. We're talking about the 1995 film Braveheart, starring Mel Gibson. See, I wasn't done with the lighthearted banter bit, but yeah, the, best, should... the best transition would have been if, while we were talking about The Passion, because he directed The Passion. Yeah, sh- should have oh, Gibson, brought so. your, your complaining about Christian movies like oh. later on, and then we yeah. would have had the smooth transition. But Chocolate Rain's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> as smooth as our transitions get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's a somewhat, it's solidly historical fiction um, about real people, more or less, but highly fictionalized. There's a lot of historical inaccuracy about the film, but that doesn't really take away from in my opinion, it's quality as a film, if you forget about a lot of that stuff. Um, so, yeah, you have uh, William Wallace, who is a boy in Scotland 
in like I want to say the gosh is it I, I forget if it's like 1100 or like a thousand ye old medieval times in England back when England and Scotland were two separate nations but England sort of conquered Scotland and is trying to subjugate, subjugate them and unite the whole English Isles. And so you have the uh, Scots naturally don't like the English, so they're not too happy about being ruled by England. Um, and when William Wallace is a boy, his dad and his older brothers are murdered by the treacherous English, and he goes off to be raised by his uncle, who's kind of a nobleman. So he gets raised, taught you know how to read and write and speak, latin and uh how to fight with the sword and comes back to his home village and is like okay um i'm ready to uh build a life of my own and settle down here but then uh the local village leaders are like you know these english soldiers here are bad news we don't like them and he's just like you know i kind of want to stay out of trouble i kind of want to like settle down and raise a family so there's this girl he knows from the village mullen they fall in love and get married, and uh, have two beautiful children, Nathaniel and Superfly. If only, <laughs> if only. They uh, so the English are occupying their village, right? And so there's one of the soldiers is uh, trying to um, impose himself on Mullen, who fights back long enough for William Wallace to stumble upon it and beat up the English soldier, but because, uh, the English are like, Hey, now you can't be going around beating up our soldiers. Time Get to die. Bucko. On, go play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like, got to hunt this guy down. So William manages to escape the village, but then Mullen isn't so lucky. And so as sort of a way to get at him, they execute her. And Wallace is like, all right, Gloves are off. Starts organizing the Scottish people of the countryside, uniting with the different chieftains and stuff of the area, and they start rebelling against the British and fighting some battles. And uh, he's sort of uh, he's a great fighter, a great leader, and people start to rally to him. Um, and the English are like, okay. The English king is like, all right, I forget which king. Um one of the Edwards, I believe. Yeah, Ed Edward Longshanks. Okay, so this takes place in the um, 1200s, late 1200s. Uh, so, yeah, they um, like, all right, well, time for us to send our army up there to crush this guy. He's causing a ruckus. Um, so he and, like, Robert the Bruce, who is, like, another, who actually in the, they sort of take the historical figure Robert the Bruce's achievements and sort of attribute them to William Wallace for the sake of the movie, and that is kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, he's like sort of the um, – he has a claim to the Scottish throne, and so he joins forces with William to uh, you know fight, fight, the, fight back the English. So it works pretty well, but then the full force of the British Army eventually defeats them. Um, so he's kind of forced to go into hiding a little bit. Um, over time, somebody betrays William Wallace to the English for a peace deal. So he is um, imprisoned and eventually executed uh, by the British. And, um, so plot's fairly simple. Uh, yeah. This movie... Um, because of, you know, Mel Gibson and like the way it's like directed and like the, the, the battles and the <sighs> warrior ways of the movie, it's, it's got this reputation as a manly movie. And honestly, it kind of, um, it, uh, oh, the big line when William is being executed, it's like freedom, even though, you know, he's, mm -hmm as he's undergoing being tortured to death. Um, anyway, it's, this movie has a bit of a reputation as a manly film. 
And uh, I think there's elements about how, you know, it was shot in the story and whatnot. It appeals a lot to, like, the... Like the, the, the male fantasy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it appeals a lot to the male. That's why I wrote a blog about this. It's, no, but no. In, in a lot of the ways, in a lot of the... A lot of good ways. Um, William is, uh, at least in the movie, is portrayed as, as sort of an archetypal man, if that's how you pronounce that. Um, he's well-educated. He knows how to fight. He's strong. You know, he wants to settle down and have a good life. But then, you know, the pursuing freedom for his people calls him to take up arms and fight for what's right so you it's know. the 1995 john wick yes <laughs> after a fashion yeah. except john wick doesn't recruit an entire army and they didn't kill his daughter his, and his wife they killed his wife which is a little more impactful um that's kind of the driving factor too is taking what he what uh, what he the person he loved away from him is what really drove him to seek the freedom of his people because that was sort of one of the conditions for like her father was like you know i don't want you to marry my daughter if you're just going to go fighting and it turns out well the fighting came to him anyway whether or not he wanted it mm-hmm. another kind of yeah the uh a little bit caricatured version of the actual historical events, but yeah, overall serviceable film. Um, let's see some of the things that didn't happen. Um, uh, William never had an affair with the English princess. That's the thing they added to the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the whole deal. There is like the King's son. The prince is sort of this, kind of shell of a man he's not that great he's sort of like a contrast to william wallace who's like virtuous has a good heart and strong and powerful and then this guy is kind of effeminate and weak and a bit of a pansy but cruel um so he's sort of a and, and so like the princess's wife is like attracted to william because of that contrast or whatever and it's it's this whole thing but uh yeah um another thing too like considering you know William's virtue the way he's portrayed in the movie is sort of as a sort of a Christ figure, figure like literally the instrument upon he is, which he is executed is a cross was cross shaped um so and like his death is see at least the movie portrays his death as something that was a rallying cry for the Scots who under Robert the Bruce did achieve their freedom from the English and like their independence, at least for a time or for a few hundred years, actually. Um, Cause I believe British unification happened like in the 1500s, which one thing I didn't realize until like I was watching this historical video was that the union Jack is the combination of the British red and white cross and the Scottish blue and white, St. Andrew's, Andrew's Cross. Yeah. Oh. And so they like put it together and I was like, oh, that's what that's supposed to be. Neat. Neat. But yeah. Yeah. I guess, Nathan, uh, you have any thoughts, observations about the film Braveheart? You know, I have seen the movie exactly once and it was a n- number of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, like, what I remember of the movie was vaguely positive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I remember the the cool charge into battle and the yeah. the, the the face paint and mm-hmm. stuff. I remember vaguely what goes on. Uh but like no specific things to add cuz it's just yeah. been a a good solid it's while been since a hot I've minute, seen. Yeah. I think there was one scene where like there's like a brief second where you can see one of the crew members are <laughs> SUV parked behind them as, <laughs> as they're charging. Oh. I'll have to, I saw that in a video. I'll have to like, next time I watch the movie, I have to like look for it. I guess, I mean, little movie Breaker mistakes immersion. like that are kind of fun to me. But no, I remember that it was just really kind of well put together, that William mm. Wallace was this kind of 
portrayed as this really strong character mm-hmm. who just embodied this more primitive not that primitive but like basic man yeah right? yeah he is like what the and not the sacri- basic as in pumpkin spice latte no no nah. like this Jeez. at its core uh it's like what it what it means to be a man in a way mm-hmm. it's like the 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 fighting for what what's right being virtuous the, being well educated being the strong, defending being your family the defending your country mm-hmm. the also the being a faithful sacrifice man. at the end the faithfulness all of that mm-hmm. was really embodied in william wallace it was like oh that's a good archetypal archetypical or archety- something archetypal like archetypal archetypal yeah tomato, tomato. archetype of man yeah i think that's probably the primary draw of the movie mm-hmm. um it's it's simple but it strikes home um yeah dang it's um there's some there's some fun moments in the movie too there's some other supporting characters like there's one of the his friends from the village hamish who's this big strong fella they um at one point you know they're kind of struggling with the movement it's not really going very well and he's just like um you know you're fighting i I think the line is something along the lines of uh you know william i think you're fighting as if you know mullen can see you it's like it's not something okay i'm butchering this but like william wallace was butchered but um he let's see i don't think she's watching me i know she's watching me and so like the you know the memory of his wife is what really drives him to uh uh, his love for her and his knowing that one day you'll see her again is what drives him to fight for the freedom for his countrymen so they don't have to face the same thing because like the whole thing Hamish is like are you sure you're not doing this for for selfishness or vainglory or whatever and he's like no like my his motives are true so that's yeah another element of him being like an archetypal man one thing I would I think would be interesting I don't know if this is something we could do a whole podcast about but maybe like there's a lot of good Christ figures to portrayed in films and i feel like some of the movies we've already talked about kind of fit that bill um because you have braveheart is one um i think the matrix yeah harry potter like we talked about last week i mean i've i've been considering uh re-watching the old uh superman movies and being like because superman is just Mm -hmm. dc jesus yeah (laughs) straight right down to the death and return yeah. Only it took 30 issues instead of three days. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see. What's the, uh, other movies would be like? Did I say that? I think I said The Matrix. Or I meant to say The Matrix. That's another one. Or, um, but yeah. Honestly, like, one of, you could say there's a Christ-like feature in any movie that features a man who sacrifices himself for the good of many. Mm-hmm. Like you yeah. could say, although uh, Tony Stark is in no way a Christ figure, no. he has a Christ-like moment at the end of Endgame. Mm-hmm. He has, he's like inherently flawed, but like his redemption is like the big strong pull of his character. And what is redemption but becoming more Christ-like? Yeah, exactly. So in William's case, he has sort of a hero's journey, but like he's never, I don't, he's never really shown to have like a fatal flaw so much. I mean, he's even like, you know, he's not perfect, but he's like betrayed by one of his men, I believe is how, uh, or like, I forget if it was like Robert the Bruce sells him out or something for peace. I forget, even though that's not what happened during history. Um, I think Robert the Bruce, who eventually became the King of Scotland, I think, I believe he didn't start fighting until well after William Wallace had been crushed, but I might be wrong on that. (sighs) Anyway, um, yeah, he's like betrayed by somebody he trusted and then that leads to his eventual death for the good of his people. So yeah, very, you know, strong Christological tones there. Um, granted with some coloring to it, you know, there's, uh life choices and women and such um primarily blue 
The blue? face paint was blue. That's the blue. color they added. Yeah. In more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Scots are colorful in a variety of ways. Uh, yeah. I guess... Um, hmm. Huh. I had a thought. Anyway, I'm supposed to go into Transcendentals. <laughs> this might be a really short podcast. Uh, I thought I had more. What job. is our shortest it's... podcast length? 40 yeah. minutes, I think. Like 40 minutes? Yeah, so I mean, maybe we'll hit that par. I forgot to. You set, You didn't set the timer? No. Um. At any rate, we, uh, so truth, I think we covered a lot of the truth, like the Christological undertones of of it and then how it sort of encapsulates like the um uh the ideal man in a lot of ways honestly the christological undertones and becoming the ideal man is sort of go hand in hand oh yeah christ is ideal man Mm -hmm. so if you want to have an archetype of virility of of uh of that, courage of, of courage of strength of strength of, of manhood a christ a christ-like figure is really perfect for that because mm-hmm. that's what that is that's what that looks like mm-hmm. and i think it's good that men are drawn to movies like this um i mean there's other there's the other mel gibson movies the patriot um it's i mean <laughs> it's I, I remember very similar when I watched uh, Braveheart for the first time, I it was like when my sister Rachel was going through a phase of let's, let's watch all the R-rated movies that mom and dad have on the shelf because <laughs> we're old enough now. Yeah, of course, all the R-rated movies mom and dad have on the shelf are R-rated movies that are otherwise morally unobjectionable. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we watched like Braveheart and The Patriot within close proximity to one another. They bear a lot of similarities. They do. Because not just Mel Gibson, but because like the sort of ideal man character, the the, the war themes, the, the revolution, rev- fighting yeah. for what's right, kind of thing, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, British, yeah. fighting the British. <laughs> <laughs> Britain, the number one supplier of Independence Days. In a lot of ways, England, well, any empire kingdom in history, is not perfect. No, England, in a lot of ways, did a lot of great things. And there's a lot of good intellectual tradition that came from that. And a lot of other ways, they're kind of messed up. Um, and so their squabbles and f- fights for subjugation of Scotland and Ireland are certainly among them. So, um, anyway. Anyway. Um, goodness. Again, sort of the Christological um, thing. But uh, uh, another thing, too, is that um, you know, Wallace is portrayed as like for the most part a man of virtue, religious man, but then he also has like a supporting cast of his friends and close supporters in the rebellion who um he draws on for strength and you know, they also look up to him and follow his lead. Um Yeah. Let's see, beauty. Film is very well shot. The really battle well scenes shot. are very uh they're really gritty. But they sort of satisfy that testosterone rage every guy has to some degree or another. It's like, yeah, let's just watch people let's just destroy mash each two other. Two armies together. <laughs> yeah, and you know, might be a bit stereotypical, but the Scots are very warlike. Warlike. Yeah, I can't talk. The Scots are very warlike, and so like seeing like the sort of the bloodlust and just like the sheer like joyful rage of battle is was is kind of entertaining from just like a sheer visceral standpoint mm-hmm. if a bit gory um but yeah good score it was filmed i believe in ireland my brother's actually or no my brother adam once went to uh ireland with some of his friends and they went to like the uh, national park in ireland where they filmed braveheart and uh, one of the it was a beautiful national park. He's he said and it was he said the grass there is like really springy just because like there's centuries upon centuries worth of like grass and 
peat in these fields Mm -hmm. so it feels kind of soft to run on so (laughs) they just (laughs) the sun was shining through the trees so they just took off running through this forest in ireland (laughs) it's like you you said you could have seen like the guys from braveheart running through the trees with you and wouldn't have blinked (laughs) um you think they would film it in scotland but you know ireland scotland they're celtic they're they're basically the same thing right if any Irishmen or Scotsmen are watch or listening, Sorry don't worry. That's not. You. We know that there's a difference. <laughs> um, unity. Overall, yeah, the film is kind of centered around you know the hero of William Wallace, but then let's see, would be it's. It's sort of like this one is like sort of the classic hero's journey arc to it because, he, you know, he comes, you know, he's got these special skills. He's not really like a nobody per se, but he kind of wants to be a nobody. Like he's trying to, you know, he's trying to just, refuse the call to action. Yeah. Which is a trying to live a normal life. See, he's journey wheel. Yeah. And he's like trying to see if he can just kind of live his life and put up with the imposition of the English and their kind of tyrannical rule over his people and just try to, you know, be make a life for himself. Like at the beginning of the movie, he's like rebuilding his family's farm that was destroyed when he, you know, his family died and he went to live with his uncle. Um, He's trying to rebuild that and build a life for himself, but then everything's kind of turned upside down on his head. So he devotes himself wholeheartedly to the fight for freedom. So, and then, you know, sacrifices his life. And the, the film implies that that sacrifice is what yields freedom for, the people of Scotland, mm. um, the movement he sort of got rolling. So yeah, um, that's Braveheart. Good stuff. Yeah, um, a lot of good things in the movie, but I will say like, the, well, there's like the historical inaccuracies, but you don't have to watch every historical film as if it's like an exact documentary because then that would be a little boring. Um, I don't know if the movie is like overestimated by some. I think there are certainly some people who like, like, oh yeah, William Wallace is a great man, but like they sort of miss the point of like, yeah, he's not just this cool action hero. Like there's like, you know, he sort of embodies like the virtues required to be like a good man Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So, yeah. Yeah. That's about all I had to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's there's a lot of movies we should just rewatch so that we can do episodes on them. And I'd be them down. More fresh in our mind. Or movies that I just straight up haven't seen yet. But we also need to finish the show. We're oh. To finish uh, My Hero Academia. Oh we're yes. Still in, we're still in the last season of that. We haven't done. Upcoming episode for sure is going to be. Um, Full Metal Alchemist. Oh, yeah. That's going to be a show. Someday. At Someday. some point. We're going to keep that in our back There's a pocket lot to pull out of that. There so, is a lot to pull out of that. That was like the first anime that Nathan and I watched with Riley. So Honestly, we could just cu- do a couple episodes about it, talk about specific mm-hmm. arcs or whatever. Anyway, in theory. But that's, where can they hear these future episodes when they come out? They can hear this episode, our past episodes, and episodes in the future on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or YouTube Music, or whatever they call it these days. Apple it's Podcasts. Google Podcasts. Google Podcasts. That's, that's what it is the now? New, the new name of the thing that it's going to be going forward. Okay. Neat. That makes sense. Um, that thing. that The new thing. And... Uh, yeah, I think that's all the platforms. You can follow us at Palapapis on Facebook and Twitter. You can email us with your questions, comments, concerns, and complaints uh, at palladingpapis at gmail.com. There's no the at the beginning. I know I say that every week, but I tried logging into the thing, and it's like, this Gmail account doesn't exist. Okay, fine. Palladingpapis at gmail.com. So if you want to complain, if a certain one of our two members wants to complain about us not covering Aquaman yet, we'll get to that. <laughs> that's on the list. <laughs> Um, it may be sort of a cop-out thing where we cover the good DC films that have come out recently. There's a short list, so we can fit them into one episode, I think. But Yeah, we will um, catch you guys in the next episode. 
later. Bye. Bye.